Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome into the next part of our ultimate guide for Anno 1800. So the city has fully developed into a bustling little curious metropolis, apparently, according to our city counter at the top. And we have everything unlocked for the base game in the old world. Our investors have everything they need met, including up to the steam carriages, which a lot of new players see and they kind of panic on because it is one of the most complex chains in the base game. It's got quite a bit going on that you need for it, but it's really not that bad at all. We've got that set up right over here with a single cab assembly line, two coach makers and two motor assembly lines. Now, the two coach makers are exactly what you have to have going into the cab assembly line. The two steam motor assembly lines is slightly more than what you need, but that's OK because you do want to be producing extra steam motors that you can use to be building more cargo ships later on. The steam carriages themselves are not that bad. You do consume very few of them. One can handle quite a large investor population, so you won't need to worry about building many until later on once you have far more investors. We currently have a total global population of 6,800 investors, so that one is going to last us quite a while. But that's it. Everything has been supplied. We have the World's Fair being started now. We're only on the first, well, the second phase, technically. The first phase is the foundations when you first place it. It has an increasing number of various workforce. It starts with farmers, then goes to workers, artisans, and then finally at engineers. The third phase does require 1,750 investors, and then 3,000 investors for the fourth phase, and the fifth phase requires 5,000 investors. So once you have all of that, you can go ahead and get started or whenever you want to get started on the World's Fair and get that going so you can have that being built and completed. It does add a lot of attractiveness to your island and it's a great way to go about getting items and different things like that that you can use for museums and zoos and trade unions and town halls and so on. At this phase of the game is when a lot of players also start getting really overwhelmed with the number of trade routes they have going on and all of the goods being moved around. If we take a look at my trade routes right here, we can see that I do have quite a few. I've got six basic trade routes right here. I've got nine going to AIs. I've got five moving goods to the capital from supply islands. One island in Nimbessa with a trade route, five coming from the New World to the Old World, and three specifically in the New World. And that's really not even many at all. A lot of people do get overwhelmed with all the trade routes, but just keep them organized and just keep an eye on what you're moving around and what you need on them. Sometimes you do have to go through and reorganize your trade routes and change what is on them. I've had to do that several times throughout this series, changing up what's over on these. Don't just throw random stuff on your trade routes. Try to keep them organized. If you need to, just delete a bunch of them and completely redo them. And also make sure the ships that you have on there are adequate. If we take a look, I've actually been changing out some of my stuff for cargo ships at this point because I need a lot of goods coming in from the New World. I have a cargo ship right now bringing over 300 tons of coffee, but you know, I'm just not sure if that's enough. The same can be said for our rum. I don't know if this is enough rum at the moment. So what I do want to double check is to see if that's enough. Again, just like we've talked about before, we're going to go under storage. We'll look at trade routes and you can quickly filter it down by clicking on the goods you're looking for. This is it right here. And it's coming in roughly every, let's see, 11 minutes, 30 minutes, 50 minutes. So about every 20 minutes. This is when I had the clippers on there. This is when I changed the cargo ships. So about every 20 minutes and I need 26 per minute. Well, that's 520. A single cargo ship can only carry 300. So we know that that is not enough. So I do need another cargo ship on this route to be bringing over more rum. Coffee is going to probably see the same issue. If we look at my trade routes. Here it is right here. Again, coming in about every 19-ish minutes. 19 and 20 is 380. So not nearly as much on the coffee, but we do need it. So I want to go ahead and add in some more ships to these trade routes just so I know that they are going to be what they have to have. I just so happen to have two cargo ships ready to go. 
Uh, not that I planned that at all. Totally did not plan that, you know. Miraculously had a couple of extra trade ships sitting around for that purpose. In terms of my trade ships, by the way, and what I do with them, uh, if you have the Sunken Treasures DLC, there is an item you can craft from Old Nate called the Jet Propeller Hur the Jet Hurricane Propeller. I highly recommend using that. Otherwise, I really, really recommend using a port dealer who has the 60% cargo slowdown and then any other sort of propeller that you can put on there. I've got the blue propellers. You can also get the epic propellers. Those all come from Archie. Just buy those from him. What you're looking for is to get that cargo slowdown at uh, as close to or at 100%. You can get 110%, I believe it is. The uh, epic version of the propeller is 50%, plus the 60 would be 110. However, there is no such thing as a 110% cargo slowdown. It only goes to 100%. But you're looking to get that cargo slowdown as close to or at 100% as much as possible. That way, your ships are not encumbered by the amount of goods they had on, have on them, and they can travel at whatever speeds your movement speed bonuses apply to the base speed of the ship itself self so definitely keep an eye on that watch for these specialists the port dealer comes from eli early game he can be a little tricky to get a hold of but later on it's pretty easy to find him and just buy as many of him as you can i don't have one up here right at the moment but typically i do have at least one cargo ship with some trade price decrease items on it and i'm constantly rolling looking for port dealers because they are just that powerful Again, if you have the Sunken Treasures DLC, just come over here to our buddy Nate and craft this guy right here, the Jet Propeller Hurricane. It already comes with an instant 100% cargo slowdown and a 25% movement speed. Once you have that, then you can just find whatever other items that do loading speed and movement speed and stack those on your ships. You don't need anything like the Port Dealer because this right here will do just fine. If you need to know about how to get special scrap quickly, check out the video I have pinned down in the comments to show you how to go about getting special scrap from this region really, really fast. So as you are continuing on in the game, especially in the late game, you're going to see that your storage starts filling up. As you can see, many of our goods are very, very full right now. We've got a lot of stuff in storage uh, and it's just all kind of, you know, sitting there, not really doing anything for us. It's not doing a thing. It's just sitting there taking up room. Uh, ships won't fully unload because there's no room for it. And you start getting situations like this where you'll see that the output storage is full and nothing can be picked up anymore. So there's two minds about this. Some people say, well, just keep expanding your storage and keep filling it up. But my question about that is why? What, what does that do for you? Yes, it's good to have a stockpile of goods in case something happens. Uh, trade ships could be sunk if you're at war with someone. Uh, you could run out of goods. Uh, factories might blow up and you don't notice. There's lots of reasons to have a stock of goods. However, do you need a thousand, ten thousand? I know one person who got 22,000 storage capacity on an island, and I don't personally understand the reason behind that. I don't think you should sit around trying to fill up storage and cap it out at all times. I think it's good to have a stockpile, but everything else is not doing anything for you. When I look at this game, I look at different ways I can make money. Yes, money is kind of irrelevant at one po at certain points, uh, because once you pass a certain amount of money, you're going to have tons of money. It doesn't matter. And there's a cap of how much money you can have in the game of one billion coins. But goods that are sitting in your storage buildings and storage capacity aren't doing anything for you. You could be making money off that. What I always recommend people to do is to go through all of your consumer goods and all of your intermediate goods and set them to sell. So how much should you keep in storage? Well, honestly, at the end of the day, it's kind of up to you and what you feel comfortable keeping in storage. I typically have chosen an arbitrary number of about 500. I like to keep at least 500 tons of a good in stock at all times. That way I have enough for sending off on expeditions. I have a stockpile in case something were to happen and I can quickly catch it. If I see it go below the 500, that tells me something is wrong with my stock and it needs to be fixed if it continuously goes below 500. That lets me know that something is not quite right somewhere and I might need to check it. 
and it also keeps your factories running. Doing this right here keeps your factories producing at all times. There is no stopping. They don't just sit there not producing anything because everything is full and just kind of in a way wasting money. Maintenance costs that are going towards production that is stalled aren't doing anything for you and you really should consider turning them off to save the coin or selling their goods off to make some coin back to continue to cover the cost of the maintenance. Again, some people don't care about that because eventually money is kind of irrelevant in the game, but at the same time, it's just a good economic decision in my view to sell those goods off and keep everything running at all times without any stopping. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, set everything, all of my consumer goods, and all of my intermediate goods that I don't need on other islands to a passive sell of about 500. All right, so as you can see, I have set everything that I felt needed to be sold to about a 500 selling stock right here. We've got it all set to about 500. Uh, I do pretty much, uh, well, of course, not on this island, except for glass. These are all excess things that we had from when our industry was here. I'm not going to sell those off. I'm going to keep that. None of this stuff is actually being brought in anymore. I'm just going to leave it there as excess stock. But I am selling off glass because we do have glass makers over here. And I'm selling off the majority of our consumer goods. The things I'm not selling off are anything that I am actually purchasing directly from any traders, such as chocolate. Now, I am selling off the coffee because even though I am buying some from Kahina, the majority of it is coming from the New World. So I am going to go ahead and sell that right there off as well. I haven't set cigars to sell because I'm bringing in so few of them that it's probably going to take a very long time. But once I see that I have an excess stock, then I'll set those to sell. I did not set the champagne to sell, though. So we're going to go ahead and set that to a 500. Now, the things I have not set to sell are things that I can sell to the AI for increased amounts of coin, such as penny farthings. I can sell those to Emperor Katima. I can sell fur coats to Madame Kahina, and I can sell the rum, beer, and schnapps to the pirates. Obviously, I'm already selling off the soap to Eli, so that one is already set to a minimum stock. And I, however, I do want to increase that minimum stock to, let's say, about 300. I don't need a lot of soap but I do want to keep a little bit more in stock than just 100. So I'll do the same thing with these later on, and I'll get those goods that can be sold for a unique price set up and get some trade routes going. Also, did not set up the pocket watches, but those also can be sold to Emperor Katima, and I can start picking some of those up and making some coin off of that, as well as the gramophones. So we take a look here. Madame Kahina did come by to do some passive trade. As you can see, she just spent 94 thousand coins uh, i don't know what all she bought because it only shows four things here but she has sold she has bought quite a bit it looks like she sold a little bit of something to me as well but she bought quite a bit right there and sold 99 94 thousand coins worth of goods in that transaction so a very nice little profit just from excess goods that i have been producing and i can sell off so always a good idea to try to set stuff to passive trade and get rid of them it's also very, very useful when you are doing things like using passive trade increase, passive trade items that give you harbor activity bonuses. Things like that would be this selection of people right here. Anything that says harbor activity on it, um, like the Hogarth or Khadija, Lady Baines, Taxman Tim, the Savvy Customs Officer, Scammer, or Bruiser, anything like this. What the harbor activity means is every time the passive trade happens, there's a 30% chance that you will gain five tons of any of the goods listed right there. So anything, anytime you have a lot of passive trade going on, these guys right here are absolutely amazing to have slotted in so you can get some bonus coming back from your passive trade at your harbor. So let's talk about something a little more advanced for the last part of this episode right here. And that is what I like to call goods micromanagement. Now, this is something you do not have to do. This is something I like to do and I think is a good way to help deal with sometimes some of your high consumption goods that you don't need everyone to have access to. Now, what do I mean by that? 
Well, let's take our engineers, for example, okay? Engineers, as you can see right here, I have disabled penny farthings for them. Now, why did I do that? Well, penny farthings are consumed in a fairly high rate by both engineers and double that for the investors. I did not want to have to continuously build more penny farthing bicycle factories. So what I decided to do was to turn that off to them. I did that to save myself the production and the maintenance cost. Now, I do lose out on the coins, obviously, but as you can tell from our total balance right now, that is not really an issue. My happiness is also fairly OK. It's not like amazing right now, but it's not doing too bad. Our engineers have a happiness of 18 on average. Uh, I could probably bump that up just a little bit by another point or two if I got the variety theater coverage a little bit better. And I am losing five happiness since I don't have the penny farthings uh, delivered to them. But that's okay with me. I'm not really that upset about that. As long as your island average happiness is over 20, then you're going to start getting festivals. So I don't really worry about it if a particular class of citizens is below 20, as long as my island average is over 20. So I saved myself some production by turning that off. You could take that a step further and take a look at something like, let's say, our artisans right here. Our artisans, maybe I don't want them to have access to something like soap, for example, or that pesky, pesky canned food. Maybe I don't want them to have access to that. I could turn that off. Now, you do have to be careful when you're turning stuff off, since obviously it is going to cost you a workforce. But if you don't need the workforce, then you can start turning things off. If I take a look at our workers on this island right here, maybe I don't want them to have access to the beer. I take a look at our happiness for our workers. They have a happiness of 30. They're really, really happy with me. So I could just turn that beer off. I only get 12 coins per home and it only gives me three happiness. It's not that big of a deal. Something like fish, for example, or work clothes, something that does not give you many workers or many coins or uh, much workforce, rather, I should say, or many coins, you can turn those goods off to them. Things I like to sometimes turn off to the engineers, especially, is something like coffee. You only get two engineers for supplying coffee, and it's a low amount of coins. Compare that to the coffee on the investors, you get eight investors from that home and 49 coins. So a lot better profit value. So I do like to go through and micromanage what my people get. So I can turn off something like the coffee and the penny farthings. Those are two things I could turn off. There are other things you can turn off if you want to, uh, such as possibly turning off maybe light bulbs to them as well. I generally like to turn off the goods that are specific to that tier. So like spectacles, coffee or light bulbs, not the stuff before, because the stuff before generally gives you the most workforce and the most coins for supplying it. Engineers give you six engineers and 39 coins for sewing machines, whereas artisans only give you two artisans and 14 coins. So I like to start going through, especially in the later parts of the game, when you start needing lots and lots of factories to keep up with larger populations, I like to go through and micromanage what my people have access to so I don't have to produce as much. When I'm ready to upgrade a particular tier, what I'll do is just re-enable the consumption of those goods. Yes, I might be in a supply deficit at that point, but it's only going to be temporary. That's why I like to have a little bit of back stock, like I said again earlier, about a 500 back stock. That's more than enough for them to chew through so I can get them upgraded and then I turn that back off real quick to them. I think goods micromanagement like this is a smart way to deal with high consumption in the game and keep yourself from having to have too many factories. You might have to build a few more buildings and it does cost you some of your balance. But honestly, a 56k balance, what am I going to waste that on? I'll never run out of money at this point, really, unless I just absolutely screw something up and completely run out of goods all over the place and things just fall apart and I 
sabotage myself somehow. I'm not going to run out of money. Workforce, especially the engineer workforce, you don't need a lot of it, and it's going to be just fine to go ahead and lose some of it. You can build more engineers and not have to worry about supplying them with more stuff. So I find it is a win-win to go ahead and deny some of those goods to decrease your consumption on them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, turn some stuff off. Let's take a look real quick first between here and Dungaree. And let's take a look at our sewing machines. We currently have a demand of 14 and a supply of 16. Uh, if we take a look at fur coats, 13 and 16. And let's say canned food, we need five. Let's take a look at those goods. And then I'm going to go through, modify things just a little bit. And then we'll take a look at it afterwards. All right, so I've let it run for a few so it can catch up with everything. We've gone down a little bit of income, as is to be expected. I turned off uh, pocket watches and coffee, obviously, for our engineers. For our artisans, I turned off canned food, fur coats, and I turned off rum to them. That's the only things I've turned off. I haven't turned off anything else to anybody. But if we take a look at our productions now, we scroll on down here. You'll see that we now have a fairly nice surplus of fur coats. We have a surplus of pocket watches and canned food. And if we go and take a look at our rum, yep, our rum is doing much better now as well. I was underproducing rum a little bit as well as coffee, and now I'm overproducing on both of those by quite a bit compared to where I was before when I was actually underproducing by almost five tons each. So it has saved me a lot of production right there and given me some room to grow on. Now, some people will argue that losing the income is a negative. However, I'm going to argue that it is not. If you take a look right here, I've only filled up about half the island with a city. So I still have a whole other half of the island to build on and plenty of other islands I have claimed that I've done nothing with. So there's still a lot of room for me to grow and expand cities. And of course, with the Sunken Treasures DLC, you still have the massive island of Crown Falls up here to build on with all of its lovely, glorious space. So I would argue that micromanaging your goods and turning things off if you don't really need the consumption on them is a good idea to do. Again, when you're ready to upgrade, all you need to do is go into the needs, turn it on, let it fill up, and then upgrade what you want and then turn it back off. It will end up in the long run saving you a lot of space, a lot of workforce at the cost of a small amount of income and population. Of course, if you are someone who is trying to go for certain population numbers, like in the millions, then turning off goods and everything might not be something you want to do. But for many casual players who aren't really caring about having massive population numbers, and they're just looking to enjoy the game and play and see what kind of fun little cities they can build, doing stuff like this is a big, big help. And that is going to be it for me today, guys. Just a few good hints and tips and tricks and some look at a f and a look at a few different things about the game that might help you get into that late investor phase and finish off the World's Fair and deal with high consumption rates of various goods that cost a lot to make and you need a lot of transport on them. Hopefully some of these tips right here helped you get through the investor phase a little bit easier and move on from there. Our next episode will be sort of the end of some of the more basic stuff about the game. We will finish off the World's Fair. We'll talk about the World's Fair briefly and what it is, what it does for you. And we will also be talking about the Palace and the Seat of Power DLC a little bit and covering some of the basics on that one. From there, we will start moving into some more advanced type stuff, talking about specialists, trade unions, town halls, items, harbor masters, and other things like that that I know many of you have been clamoring for more information about that sort of thing. So stay tuned for that. I think you'll be enjoying the next handful of episodes that come out as we dive into more advanced parts of Anno 1800. And with that, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below, and I will see you in the next episode. Until then, take care.